So, Leslie, um, a very provocative set of remarks just then. Um, and we'll go on to talk in a little bit about your, your own background and some reflections around business education and so on. And I hope also to leave a few minutes over the next half an hour, half an hour or so for, for questions. But um, first of all, I just have to come back to some of your mm -hmm. um, remarks. Um, and the first thing I'd say, I mean, I, I traveled quite often to China over a number of years, but I lived also um, for a number of years in Russia. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm intrigued about the comparison between the two systems. Um, and I would, um, you know, one thing that strikes me is one of the fundamental differences between those two systems is, you know, uh, you argued for the value, the lasagna stripes, if you like, of the state. But of course, it seems to me um, there are a couple of other, if you like, pre-communist drivers of China's success today, one of which is um, social control and hierarchy, the Confucian system and the, and the tradition and loyalty of the family and the community and so on, um, which has a quite important uh, influence. Um, and the other thing is, of course, a very strong and long entrepreneurial tradition, uh, which pre-existed. Russia, by contrast, as you know, was essentially a surf Mm -hmm. dominated society which never had an industrial revolution, that never really had a middle class, mm -hmm. that never really actually had, beyond a thin layer of aristocracy, um, a sort of capitalist system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to me, one of the big drivers of the collapse, and uh, as it were, the impossibility of drawing out what happened in China, um, was that you didn't have those antecedents. So I'm just interested in your reflections on, you know, how much it's the post-1949 system in China that's driven its success today and how much actually these underlying and longer term historical and cultural uh, mm -hmm. distinctions that are really also at least as important. Uh, my uh, response, uh, Andrew, is that there's a continuity, you, you draw a contrast between the historical period and the modern period, but in fact there's a, there's a continuity between the two. That is to say, China has always had an authoritarian government with a benevolent ethos, and it has always been too big to govern, given the, um, the uh, relatively no, low numbers of the bureaucracy. So they had no choice but to allow a entrepreneurial culture based on uh, family and village. And so that, as you say, has always been there. And uh, one of my remarks was that the connection between the authoritarian state, which how, uh, that we see today, leaving room for entrepreneurship, that has always been there. So in that sense, I, I would agree with you that that uh, uh, combination has not really been uh, present in Russia, and uh, to its detriment, neither has there been a, an ethos within Russia of responsible authoritarianism in the same way that there has been in China. Obviously, there have been many historical episodes and also many individuals who don't honor that tradition, but that tradition und undoubtedly is there. And then also a little bit by way of comparison, um, but it's true there's an eternal debate in Russia about the trade-offs around autocracy and authoritarianism. Um, but thinking about the China model, and I mean, I'm a bit bluntly shocked by the sort of, <laughs> you know, um, implicit, uh, the benefit of killing off 10 million plus people mm -hmm. was that it allowed the development of a high-speed rail system and so on. But, but, but going beyond that, um, do you think there are limits to political control of, of autocracy. I mean, we've seen clearly mm. a resurgence of the state, both, <laughs> both in terms of power, of control within institutions, including education, the limitation mm -hmm. of free speech, um, uh, a, a re-nationalization, mm -hmm. uh, often of smaller enterprises even as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's a tension ultimately that will crack open that system, or do you think a single party dominated structure can continue to encourage uh, you know, the fast development that we've seen in recent uh, I decades? I think um, this is a very, uh, it's a key question, and I think underlying it is perhaps an over 
simplified picture of what these guys are trying to do, uh, I think we all accept that they're trying to stay in power. And they would prefer to stay in power without having to kill a lot of people. And therefore, they are using information technology to, in fact, supervise the low-level officials who are, in fact, the worst offenders. So that uh, we all have heard about uh, um, a million guys supervising the internet, but one of the things that they supervise is online criticism of low-level officials. So they're actually using, they are encouraging, you might say, um, online mobs to identify bad officials and then they get nailed from people who are higher up. So that's what I mean when I say uh, it's too simple to say, to, to pose the question as saying, are they gonna keep on clamping down or, uh, or not? Um, they may, their main targets for a clampdown are their own corrupt officials, because if they manage to control that, they preserve legitimacy, they preserve power. And that's the most efficient way of maintaining control. So let's just uh, project China forwards a little bit. Um, I mean, you talked about, as you say, the undoubted high rates of investment and savings and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, there is concern, isn't there, about whether there's something of a, of a bubble, particularly in property, particularly, again, perhaps around state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. and that could at some point burst. What's your own take on that? Uh, undoubtedly, there's a serious problem and uh, recent research by, I think, Tsinghua University of all people using satellite imagery has disclosed that a large, you know, large numbers, as it were, of empty apartments and shrinking cities, uh, which raises a serious question as to the um, e efficiency and the viability of continued uh, investment uh, in things like infrastructure. So there's no denying that this is a huge problem. The, uh, it is, however, contained by some basic facts about China. One is that uh, capital controls, so you can't have capital flight to a significant extent. Another is this, what, the, what I mentioned, which is the, all these assets that are on the balance sheets of state-linked entities they are always available to be thrown into the, um, to stave off a, any uh, bankruptcy that might have a ripple effect. So, um, and, and finally, we have uh, instruments available to authoritarian, but basically effective uh, officials. Uh, for example, if you've got all these empty apartments and you've got you know, tens of millions of empty apartments, well, there's plenty of people in China who don't have very good housing. You just shift them in and you, you know, expropriate a few um, big property developers and you've got a, uh, not quite a win-win situation, but you, because you have um, authority, uh, a monopoly of authority within a system that is more responsible than not, you can make good uses of resources in a ways that other countries cannot manage. I, I want to talk perhaps towards the end a little bit about you know, your thoughts on the current global retrenchment a little bit from globalization and so on, and perhaps that might be a, a question also for folks in the audience. But let's just talk a little about your own personal journey. Um, mm -hmm. So you, um, is it right? I, I could call you a sea turtle in a sense. Yeah, you were. a turtle. You've returned from uh, abroad well, to China, right? Um, mm. I actually left China at age two to New Zealand. Because so, and what drove that? Sorry, and why, oh, why, why um, I was uh, just usual immigration for economic opportunity. It turned out to be a big mistake. I would have been richer had I stayed <laughs> in China. So I need. Um, but so I grew up in New Zealand, and culturally, I'm a New Zealander. Uh, and, um, but I, most of my career has been spent, uh, firstly, at uh, went back to New Zealand, went to um, uh, University of Texas at Austin, and then 20, 20 odd years in Hong Kong, and now five years in Hong Kong. So 
uh, with regard to returning to China, that is because, I think basically one could say is because I have a good relationship with my parents. So that, that means I have a benign view of Chinese culture, but within growing up in New Zealand, which is a wonderful country full of very generous people who, who made us very welcome, I have a benign view of Western culture too. So I'm very open to uh, cultural diversity and cultural experiences. And um, intellectually, I find the China-Western combination contrasts the way in which their cultures operate differently, how this translates into economic activity. That is, um, I guess, the core question that I, I want to spend my life answering. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, having spent so much time, particularly in a more Western, as it were, education system, how, what were the things that struck you most, perhaps, returning to, to China to research? Actually, um, if in, in personal terms, uh, I was struck by how comfortable I was in a Chinese society, meaning that I instinctively did seem to be doing and saying the right things. So although I'd spent most of my life in the West, when I went to Hong Kong, it was like I put on an old set of clothes and um, put it very simply, people liked me. And, and that always feels nice, you see. So um, I only went there on sabbatical, but uh, I was so comfortable there. Everything was so familiar and comfortable uh, that um, I was very happy there. Then um, in terms of my research, I think a story can be told like this. Okay, there's the gee whiz fact about Leslie Young who finished his PhD at 20. How did he do it? He actually reconstructed a whole area of mathematics in a new way. I couldn't be bothered reading what other people wrote. I just uh, reconstructed a large area of mathematics. And so thus, I had kind of an abstract or axiomatic approach to complex systems. And ever since, I have been interested in providing what you might call an, an axiomatic explanation of the difference between Chinese history and Western history leading all the way up to the structure of their modern economies. So give us a little bit of a flavor of your current areas of research and what okay, your uh, okay. um, theses are. So what is the geographical foundation of the differences in Chinese culture versus Western culture? Right? And um, the obvious explanation is that China is one big uh, agricultural area and, China, and Western Europe is many small enclaves. As a, as that is what everyone says, it is false, simply because uh, Europe is, does have one big agricultural area, which is today France and Germany, which today dominates uh, Western Europe, including the European Union. So that is not the key difference. Uh, key differences include the fact that the Mediterranean lands in which civic culture first developed were more densely populated originally than the northern lands which were forested. So the, the, a balance was struck between two different types of social organization, a civic versus a warrior culture. In China, the, uh, the balance never changed. The Mongols, as it were, continually rebooted uh, Chinese society over five dynasties, but they never had the population growth to fundamentally change its culture. So Chinese culture continually recycled and was renewed by nomadic warriors from the north in a way that was not possible in Europe, which also had the injection of um, deep religious feeling uh, from the Middle East. And that is an injection for which there's no real counterpart in China. So that as a result of these three forces, you have much greater complexity and diversity and dynamism in Western history compared to China. And actually, again, comparing the two regions, what about the uh, imperialistic instinct, if I could put it that way? I mean, is there the same dynamic to expand beyond Greater China's borders, as it were, as there was in the 18th and 19th century in Europe, for example, or is there a different trajectory that's more <coughs> internally focused? Uh, we can summarize it as follows. Um, the Jewish people 
pioneered the concept of themselves as the chosen people. And this uh, has been inherited, for example, by the Americans. They think they're the chosen people. Uh, China is different. They are the only people. Right? They're not simply chosen. They're the only people. They, they have always dominated their corner of the world. So their perception of geopolitics is that uh, an extension of the Chinese family in which the senior member, China, owes, is entitled to deference but must uh, give out benevolence. So it's a different worldview. But is it one that would drive a less, you know, imperialist or globalistic perspective, do you think? Or, I mean, if you look at the Belt and Road that you referred to earlier today, for mm -hmm. example, should one see that in a similar or a, a different way, for example, to the drive of, you know, the British Empire or the, uh, indeed, American international expansionism over the past decades? And both the British and the American uh, cultures uh, pride themselves on being open and being what you might call um, uh, equal. That is, uh, they are systems held together by rules. And it's that such a system can, in principle, be universalized, and in fact has been universalized. Uh, but of course, that is now coming, stuttering to a halt. The Chinese uh, culture is inherently Chinese. It probably can't be universalized. So probably the best they can do in terms of globalization is A, to spread its infrastructure, and B, spread Chinese people all over the world. But I think there's no, uh, its culture is, um, is proud and self-centered, but I don't think it has the ambition to universalize its culture. So tell us just a little bit about the teaching and your students oh, yes. today um, mm -hmm. and what, the, what their demands, priorities, focus are. Uh, I have taught uh, MBA, EMBA students, both from Western schools and from uh, chi Chinese uh, entrepreneurs. They, uh, all, all these experiences have been extremely positive because high level uh, business people are usually very intelligent and actually intellectually very curious. So it has been a wonderful experience to be teaching them. Uh, they uh, differ in, one could say that the Chinese students, they have a great sta greater standard deviation. They have a greater diversity of personalities. The uh, Western MBA students, EMBA students, tend to be uh, um, um, what do we call it? fairly um, slick and homogeneous. The Chinese, um, you can get very rough personalities who are very clever, uh, but are very rough and rude, frankly. So you have to, you have to cope with that and kind of integrate them into uh, a, a collectivity, but it's a uh, fascinating experience. The chi Chinese entrepreneurs, many of them started with nothing, and they just had their own brains, their drive, their dynamism. At the same time, Chinese people have a very sophisticated way of dealing with human relationships. So you uh, it is on those grounds uh, quite fascinating to deal with people who are, can be, who are very rough, very rich, and very sophisticated in human relations. It's, it's a fascinating experience. And yeah, I mean, I, I was there, including at your school uh, last autumn. One thing that strikes me, you know, they're very, there's a great appetite for very practical lessons yes. and insights. I mean, what, what are the sorts of areas of focus that you find the greatest demand for? Uh, tax havens. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I get the most interest. They all sit up when I explain that it's actually rather easy to open a bank account in Jersey. Uh, it only takes, uh, only took me three hours to, uh, to set up a trust and a bank account and save myself literally a million dollars of taxes in New Zealand. And so that, that got their attention, you could say. Um, but I wouldn't quite agree with you. I, I certainly agree that there's this deeply practical side 
uh, to uh, Chinese businessmen, but I've been very gratified by how fascinated they are by, well, the, the, the example I always trot out, they're very interested in theology of all things, in the difference between the fundamental beliefs of the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, how this might explain the difference between Russia and the West. Uh, they, uh, I actually had a group of people, it was actually within the last three months, uh, students from the EMBA program, they requested a lecture on uh, Christianity and its impact on business. And, and in terms of the, um, the destinations, the kind of opportunities for some of the students, the Chinese students that you're teaching now, I mean, what, what do you see as the big areas of growth? Where are they going? Oh, what are they doing? Uh, China has ch transforms itself every five years. So the um, big areas are uh, uh, related to technology, but all, most obviously, but also to um, uh, rather surprising thing, high-end consumption. That is things like uh, fashion, uh, like music. Uh, so um, that we are starting an MBA program in uh, it was called the Bay Area, Greater Bay Area. And we're not talking San Francisco, we are talking the Pearl River Delta. That has a population bigger than California, and arguably it has more capital than is present in Silicon Valley. So we have very different cities. We're connected with very good infrastructure there. We have Shenzhen, which has transformed itself into the high-tech center of China. We have Hong Kong, Macau. And, and so this area has been targeted by the Chinese government as a rival to Silicon Valley. And, and so they, they are fostering um, high technology in this area and giving this area um, educational resources and uh, what we call political protection so that they can grow high technology. But because this is the richest area of China, it is also the leading edge of consumption. So far, consumption has been somewhat imitative of the West, and, but now's the time to, with greater self-confidence, you might say, the, that there's room to, uh, for cultural fusion in terms of high-end consumption. And otherwise, in terms of the sort of career areas, um, whether they're going into bigger companies or more enthusiastic about starting their own businesses, what are you seeing amongst uh, your students? The, the um, entrepreneurship is uh, the future. The, um, the MBA education in China has become a mass product that is, um, there is pretty soon there's going to be a million people with, with an MBA, of course with varying, coming from different kinds of schools. So um, that is uh, driving down salaries. So people who had expected one level of salary end up with uh, losing their job and then having to re-employ at half that. So the um, opportunity to make money in China uh, in uh, entrepreneurship, but there are many, many opportunities, on, uh, entrepreneurial opportunities, just because China is changing very fast, changing in terms of um, tastes, uh, in terms of knowledge of the rest of the world, in terms of travel. So, uh, because it's important to emphasize something very crude, there's a lot of money in China. There's a lot of money. When uh, recently I've been buying an apartment for my daughter. That already tells you something. A professor can afford to buy an apartment for his daughter in London cash, right? And what struck me was how little the lawyer and the tax accountant were, were receiving from me. I mean, uh, I thought, gosh, these fees are very reasonable. Uh, these are quite well-qualified people. 
I would have to pay five times the same this amount in Hong Kong even. So uh, there's plenty of poor people in China, but there's just a lot of money. And where there's a, a lot of disposal income, there's a lot of opportunity. It's as crude as that. There are a lot of people with lots of money looking for ways to spend it. You've got to help them, right? But, you got, but these are intelligent and sophisticated people. So um, you, to get their money, to get them to part with their money, you have to bring something to the table that is a genuine experience, uh, <coughs> a genuinely new and satisfying product. So we're almost out of time, but maybe there's, if, if there's one burning question perhaps we could take, if anyone's um, got one. Um, yeah, please, in the middle. I think China has everything, except I cannot identify the cultural export from China that uh, yes. makes people in the West go, wow, China is cool. I, can't, I don't know what that is. And don't give me pandas or opera or the wall of China or food. Something else. Uh, I, agree. I actually have to agree with you that um, the, uh, the, uh, the one would have to... I mean, obviously, I can come up with some uh, examples, but in fact, uh, cultural exports are not um, going to be a strength. I would agree with that. Yeah. Just so we, we're almost at the end. Just give us a, a little bit of a sense. You know, you alluded to uh, Donald Trump and so on. We're seeing this new era of protectionism. We're seeing a lot of criticism amongst others of China for dumping, um, for IP issues and so on, as you, you cited. Um, what, what's going to, and indeed Huawei, which you mentioned, what, what's going to happen, do you think? Give us a sort of five-year view on China's place and that sort of its it integration into the global system, given the sort of populist and more inward-looking mm -hmm. tendencies at the moment. Uh, undoubtedly, those tendencies are going to dampen China's growth, but because the internal economy is now very large and diverse, the scope to maintain the growth rate simply by getting Chinese to consume more. And there's a way of doing that, for example, by um, making the health system more reliable. That would, in itself, reduce savings and therefore increase uh, consumption. Uh, there are opportunities in terms of uh, building infrastructure and in improving the urban environment in the uh, central and uh, western China. And finally, there are big opportunities for the Belt and Road is in part, of course, a, 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 what you call, a vent for surplus capacity. So there is, uh, um, there are products designed for the third world, that is in central and western China, that are very useful and valuable in the real third world. So uh, uh, obvious example is um, solar panels, low cost uh, mobile phones, but um, this is an area where China has relatively less competition in that it is, you see, think what is China? You've got a, a very sophisticated manufacturing base sitting next to a third world, which is also in China. And there's the Chinese businessmen that you haven't heard of because you are not buying third world level products. But there's a whole uh, layer of Chinese production that's targeting relatively poor Chinese and having designed their products for rough conditions, uh, those are exportable around the world, the third world. So Leslie, well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time, although hopefully you'll still be around later if um, people want to chat a bit sure. informally, but do please thank uh, Leslie. Thank you.